Good morning. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The Global Food Supply Chain and Smart Technologies and Food Safety Post-COVID-19. My name is Claire Forrestier and I'm your host today. I've been brought in by HQTS who are sponsoring today's event. HQTS have been providing quality assurance services around the world for more than 25 years. They're headquartered in Asia, but located in 16 countries around the globe. HQTS provides supply chain quality solutions for commercial and consumer goods. Things like inspections, audits, testing, and certification are among their services. And they also take care of the production process management, production monitoring, training, and they offer consulting to their clients as well. Now, these clients include companies in many verticals from agriculture, the automotive industry, construction, commodities, electronics, food, government, machinery, textiles, and toys. The list is, is pretty, pretty comprehensive. So that's HQTS. I'd really like now to introduce your speakers to you. So first of all, I would like to welcome Dennis Tracy. Dennis has been in the fast moving consumer goods industry for 40 years. So he started in Unilever, but he's gone to Arla, to InBev. And until recently, he was the president and the chief safety quality and security officer for the snack food giant Pladis Global. And he also led the health and safety agenda for its parents company, Yildiz Holdings. So now he's CEO of Culture Compass, Compass even, and Dennis helps businesses deliver their own transformational performance improvements. So good morning, Dennis. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. So I, um, it's exciting what you guys are going to be talking about today because it's so current in the, um, to everybody, whether they're in the food industry or supply chain at the moment. It's something we're all talking about and interested in. So we're going to be hearing a lot more from you in a minute. But give us a taster. OK, well, first of all, thank you to HQTS and yourselves and to all the people that have joined. Um, the food manufacturing environment at the moment is, is quite dynamic uh, and certainly COVID has had an impact on that. So we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail. I'm going to talk about the global food supply chain and the potential impacts that that's had today. And hopefully we can, you know, get some good discussion going a little bit later on. Brilliant. OK, so we'll be hearing from you in a minute. Our second speaker today is Ron McNaughton. He is the head of the Scottish Food Crime and Incidents Unit for Food Standards in Scotland. Ron took up this role after 30 years in the police service. So uh, really interesting career and, and experience that you're bringing, Ron. He, his last five years, he was leading the investigations into serious and organised crime in his role as force authorizing officer and head of intelligence for Tayside Police. So hi, Ron, you're going to be giving a presentation on food crime shortly. You know what I'm going to ask? What, what's the what's the key key thing you can tell us now? A little taster. Um, yeah, well, um, food fraud is uh, ongoing. Um, it's uh, been widely publicized. Um, COVID-19 is just really, I suppose, added uh, I have mention to that. So this morning I'm going to be talking about the most common types of food fraud, um, the impact of COVID-19 on food crime and what we're looking to do to try and uh, mitigate that. And I'll touch on how, uh, how countries, how some countries are working together to tackle food crime. Brilliant. Thank you so much. OK, so we'll see. We'll, we'll be hearing from you later. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Manuel Mercado, who is the global head of blockchain solutions at Worldline. So he's had an 18 year career in tech solutions, including blockchain, IoT and AI, digital identity, tokenization. These are the kind of things that Manuel works in. And he's also a member of the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum. So welcome, Manuel. Really looking forward to your presentation. Could you give us a tiny hint of, of what we'll be hearing? Okay. Uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you to HQTS and the whole uh, audience that is joining us uh, to having me here. And uh, today we're going to go, uh, we're going to have a look at how uh, block, uh, supply chains uh, are working today, uh, how digitalized they are, and how uh, the digitization uh, issue is becoming so critical, especially in the context of uh, COVID uh, the health uh, crisis, but also uh, looking at uh, the requirements from the general public, uh, regulations and, and so forth. So uh, we are forced, we are seeing how we are getting very strong recommendations to fully digitalize supply chains. Fantastic. Thank you so much. 
looking forward to that one as well. Lots to, lots to be excited about today. Okay, so we are, as I say, going to be talking about a lot of different things. We've got each of the speakers coming on separately to give the context with Ron and um, Dennis about the impact of COVID-19 on food safety and the integrity of the global supply chain. And then we're going to hear from Manuel about how technologies like blockchain can help the food industry and the supply chains. So we're then going to talk a little bit about the role of third party quality assurance providers and then we'll move on to a Q&A session. We've had some questions from the audience already, but I'd really love it if you could use the Q&A function at the bottom of your um, Zoom sort of square. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, you just click onto it, you ask your question or if someone else has pretty much asked it already, you can click. I think a tick on it to upvote it. As I've said, we've had a few sent in already and we'll get our best to get through everything. We'll do our best to get through everything, but if any burning questions that we don't get to, HQTS will get the answer to you, so don't worry. So Dennis, you're up first with a presentation on how food safety and the integrity of the global supply chain have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The rest of us are gonna switch off our cameras and microphones and leave you alone on the stage, so to speak. I hope that's okay. <laughs> So take it away, Dennis. Okay, thank you very much. And good morning to everyone. Good morning to all the callers uh, and attendees, uh, both across the UK and also the world. And my uh, best wishes to all of my friends in Turkey. I know a number of those are on, so good morning. Gunaydin, Hoşgel Dennis. So if I could have my first slide, please. Okay, so this is my interpretation, my experience over the last 40 years of managing across global businesses, uh, businesses with global footprints. So, uh, you know, multiple countries, multiple regions. And uh, the threat of food safety very much depends upon how far you extend your supply chain. So if you're a business that's local, uh, you manufacture, you source your ingredients locally, then obviously there is uh, a threat to your business from food safety that generally will become an internal threat. Uh, so that's what I call tier one. So your core business, you, you've got your, your, your supply chain, you've got your manufacturing all in close proximity. So that enables you to keep much better control over your business than if you were to extend further. As you start to move out and you start to look at dedicated co-manufacturing and co-packing, uh, you might ask other, other people to provide that service for you, then, then you lose a little bit of control. You're reliant upon uh, other businesses to do what you require to, to manage your brand integrity. Uh, you can move further out again. So you move to what I call tier three, where you are looking to business service providers that provide non-dedicated services. They're not absolutely uh, um, supplying just to you, they're supplying to other people. So you're in competition with uh, some of their other service providers or some of their other customers. So again, you've got to think a little bit differently about that. And then as we move further and further out, uh, the uh, tier four and tier five, where the product's actually out in the marketplace now, the, the threat of uh, what I would call economic gain uh, by you know, uh, um, agents that might want to do your business harm becomes increasing. The further you go towards the core, what you believe in and what you transmit as your business values uh, become your ideological threat. So hopefully this is just a simple interpretation that shows the kind of things you've got to consider and then apply your um, necessary uh, controls in place for each of those. Doesn't mean that that doesn't work. You know, working with service providers can be a very, very important solution to some of your challenges. So uh, and we can talk about, about that a little bit further. Um, in the presentation but if I could have my second slide if you think about those direct threats to your food safety and your food integrity then you've got for me it's it's, it's broken into two halves with different con considerations quality and safety you know if you talk about unconscious disruption uh, for me that's unintentional contamination uh, and for me that's when you're you know to be to be blunt you're unprepared or you're ill-equipped so you haven't considered your own internal risks as you move across to conscious disruption, where there's an ideological or an, or an economic gain from an external party, then that's when you need to, again, think differently. This is where much more reliant upon service providers 
and agents working with you to ensure that that protection that you have across your entire supply chain from what I call, as I said, conscious disruption is, uh, is the thing that makes, uh, makes the selection of such service providers critical. Could I have my next slide? So let's think about the global supply chain. Now let's think about this, this agent COVID-19, this agent disruptor. Now, for some businesses that maybe haven't had a, a, a well-structured and resilient uh, plan in place, that don't understand their risks, that don't understand their supply chain, and maybe don't, uh, haven't put the necessary procedures in and processes in to manage an event like this, I'm sure that this will have been a major distraction. All the services and resources that are available to this business have been completely tied up in ensuring that, uh, that, that, that a business doesn't become a victim of this. But if you've considered your risks, and if you have got measures in place to react and respond to this, this volatile world that we live in, uh, and the things that can come from uh, events like uh, COVID-19, if you've got the right service providers in place, if you've understood your supply chain, and you've got the measures to react to this, then this will have been still a disruption, but it will have been also an opportunity uh, because not everyone will survive uh, uh, from a business point of view at the end of this process. So it's about planning, it's about making sure you've got the right relationships in place. Uh, my next slide, please. So this is about, about understanding exactly what your risks are, what your risk profile is, what risks you're prepared to take as a business because you know, you can safeguard for everything, but maybe that's not an economic reality for you or a capability for you. So thinking about your risks and thinking about the, the profile of your risks and how you manage those is critical. Now, as we move out of COVID, uh, lots of businesses will be looking at their organizations, looking at their structures, looking to understand how they can perhaps, you know, remodel financially uh, to enable them to be more competitive as we go into this new world post COVID. So people will be thinking about their internal structures, their internal resources, and maybe looking to uh, uh, partner up with service providers that can help them to secure their supply chain going forward. So, you know, this is an opportune time for people to really think about this, but you've got to do it properly. You've got to think about planning for continuity, but also for, for preparing for the next crisis. So decisions you make now are going to be critical going forward. Uh, my next slide. And that's where, you know, we're working with HQTS, who are a service provider, and, and, and Claire's already made uh, uh, um, us aware of all the services that are provided, but your supply chain is the most critical thing. Uh, and it's not, just about, it's not just about finding service providers, it's about building service relationships. So you need to be able to trust businesses that are gonna look after your supply chain, manage the integrity of your brands and deliver the promise that you've made to your consumers. So, you know, make the choice, consider the risks and, um, and prepare yourself for the, for the new world that, uh, that comes. Claire, that's all I really, I think, wanted to say at this point. So if I could hand back to you now. Yeah, of course. Um, Hi, thank you so much. Well, I wanted to ask you there, really. Um, you're kind of talking about all the risks and, and things like that. And there's been stuff in the news about food containing COVID-19. Can the virus, yeah. while we're on this call, it's the time to ask it, can the virus actually be transmitted by food at any point, you know, from the sourcing of raw materials, the manufacturing, the packing, okay. there's, there's got to be a risk, surely. Okay, so I've been working with the IFST, I've been on their COVID panel advising the UK government, advising Food Standards Agency, Food Standards Scotland and DEFRA for, since February, basically. And we've been working through all these scenarios. We've been providing a, a knowledge hub. The IFST now has a knowledge hub that's accessible to everybody, completely free, all the information that you might need in order to, in, to manage that. So we've been looking at this very, very closely. We've been exploring this. And yes, you can, uh, you can locate this agent on surfaces. You can locate it on hard surfaces, soft surfaces. It's been captured from the air, from uh, vapours and, uh, and the like. There is still yet to be anyone that has proven that you can become infected by uh, this COVID agent being on food. So yes, there is a concern. Yes, people can find it on, on products and food products, but 
I am, as far as I can, can make out, the last time I checked with the World uh, Health Organization, they were still unable to present every, any evidence that suggests that you can become infected by an agent on food. It may still happen, but not yet. Okay, that's encouraging to hear. Thank you. You clearly, Carry on as I said, <laughs> yeah, you've been in, well, you've been talking to everyone who's in the know and you clearly absolutely know what you're talking about. So that's, that's reassuring. Um, we're going to move on to um, the next um, presentation now from, from Ron and obviously we'll join you later for the Q&A. So um, welcome back to the stage, Ron, if you're hopefully there. <laughs> Great, so you're ready to go. I will leave you to it. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Claire. Um, again, good morning to everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to to be part of the the panel today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, what I'm planning to do is really just look in the main at the potential impact of COVID nineteen on food crime, as we uh, call it here in the UK. Um, and so I'm going to touch on. Uh, firstly, some of the uh, potential crime techniques that uh, that we may come across. So if I can have the next slide, please. Okay, well, um, we're very lucky in the UK because we have two dedicated food crime units. Um, we've got the National Food Crime Unit, which has responsibility for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we've got ourselves at the Scottish Food Crime and Incidents Unit uh, at Food Standards Scotland, covering Scotland. Scotland. And, and as, as, as you can no doubt imagine, we face a common threat across all four nations within the UK. Uh, and therefore, we work very closely with the FSA's food crime, food crime Unit. And to that end, we work under a common definition for food crime, which, uh, which is serious fraud and related criminality within food supply chains. So to break that down, what you might see is adulteration, so reducing the quality of food products through the inclusion of a foreign substance with the intention either to make product production costs lower or a higher quality. Uh, substitution, so replacing a food product or ingredient with another substance of a similar but inferior kind. Uh, misrep misrepresentation of origin, quality, provenance or benefits, so the marketing or labelling of a product so as to inaccurately portray its quality, safety, benefit, origin or freshness, and document fraud, so the use of false or misappropriated documents to sell, market or otherwise vouch for a fraudulent or substandard product. Um, but we need, need also to be aware of theft, misrepresentation of durability dates, unlawful processing and of course waste diversion. So these techniques, they aren't new. This is criminally, criminality, which has been ongoing globally prior uh, to COVID-19. The pandemic has just added to the problem by providing greater opportunities for criminals to exploit the situation further when we are more vulnerable. And also, I suppose, for legitimate businesses to stray into criminality because of the hard times they might be facing. But what I would stress is, so apart from seeing some evidence of supplements being advertised as a cure for COVID-19 so far, and I would stress so far, we haven't really received any intelligence or evidence of food crime or criminality related to the food sector, which we can be expressly linked to COVID-19. But I do believe that that position will change and we'll start to, to see some of those threats transpire. So what is the threat and what do I see as the influencing factors associated with COVID-19 related to food crime? Well, there is greater opportunity for criminality related to food uh, over the short, medium and longer terms. Um, and this is relevant for every country globally. And why is that? Well, there's financial uncertainty and pressures on businesses. And because of this, as I've already said, legitimate, legitimate businesses may stray into non-compliant or fraudulent behaviours in the short to medium terms. We've got regulator resource limitations, so agreed deviations from food law, codes of practices because of compete, competing demands on regulators. That may mean that authorities might not have the opportunity to identify and act upon criminality. That said, what we're finding in the UK is that because local regulators, are, local regulators are visiting businesses to make sure they're COVID-19 compliant. And whilst they are doing that, they're considering both food standards and food safety. So they are thinking about food crime. Um, substitution of ingredients or additives, where well, the global supply disruption that you've heard Dennis talk about, that's been well publicised and this could introduce new contaminant or adulteration risks. 
and what I would call something uh, called criminality crossover, so which is the potential for individuals or groups traditionally involved in other criminality to seek to move into the food sector with the purpose uh, to commit food crime. Food supplements, well, you know, um, sorry, if you could just go back to the, 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 the previous slide. Um, you know, as highlighted earlier, um, it's been advertised as a cure and defence for COVID-19. We are seeing, we are seeing um, that uh, materialise um, in a number of countries. But the areas for exploitation are significant, uh, particularly with the stresses on supply chains. And we've already seen panic, panic buying of particular items, so that adds, adds to the problem. And what's the influencing factors? Well, high demand for specific food items. That gives the potential opportunity for substituted or counterfeit product. Increase in online food purchases, where supply chain information may be limited. Countries undertaking food protectionism. Uh, changing consumer buying habits. Uh, that presents a criminal opportunity for financial gain. And what I would suggest is uh, um, uh, food crime fear. So increased anxiety and fears that may create vulnerability for exploitation by those adulterating, substituting or misrepresenting food. So what, I, what might we see? Well, um, it's likely or probable that we're already experiencing shipments entering our countries, which have been subject to adulteration, substitution, misrepresentation to varying degrees. Uh, but as yet, we've not been able to assess the scale of this globally. However, the further we get into this crisis, uh, definitely the more we will, we will learn. Next slide, please. So what are we doing in Scotland uh, and the UK to mitigate the increased threat? Well, initially, we've produced a problem profile looking specifically at the food crime risks associated with COVID-19. And all that a problem profile is, is an intelligence product where all the information and intelligence known as analysed, risk assessed and an action plan developed to mitigate those risks through prevention, intelligence and enforcement. Uh, we've prioritised these risks based on the probability of them occurring from a remote chance at one end to highly likely or almost certain at the other end of the scale. Uh, what, what, what's worthwhile highlighting is that those food, food crime risks that pose a threat, not just the UK, but also Europe and globally. Uh, here in the UK, we pride ourselves as having one of the safest and most authentic food industries in the world. However, we can't rest on our laurels and neither should any other country. The threats are serious uh, and we need to be prepared. Uh, what we're doing well is focus on an approach which incorporates the development of three lines of defence. So that's food businesses and industry, consumers and regulators and law enforcement. But we can't do this alone. Um, uh, these three lines of defence contribute to raising awareness in food crime. One of the ways we're doing that is through the Scottish Food Crime Hotline, which is a 24-7, 365 days a year uh, uh, telephone line that people uh, uh, can contact and we're uh, particularly encouraging people from industry and consumers to get in touch anonymously and that's where they can provide information and confidence that we will uh, act upon. Uh, there are a few breakout points uh, where consumers are aware that they've been the victim of food crime. Uh, however, those working in, in industry we really need to focus on industry because they may be well aware of food criminality taking place and for one reason or another may be reluctant to, to report that. This hotline, uh, this phone line gives uh, individuals the opportunity to do that anonymously gives them a safe space to flag up. Um, it also helps to identify instances of criminality, support investigations, prevention and enforcement activity. And although there will always be a place for enforcement, I can't emphasize enough the importance of information intelligence sharing to, better, to be better informed and prevention activities. These are areas we've got to focus on uh, working together if we want to have a real impact on food crime. Um, just moving quickly to the, I suppose, my last slide. Um, uh, you know, finally, I, I wanted to share with you some new work that's underway. I recently became the chair of the Global Alliance on Food Crime, which was set up uh, in order for Australia, New Zealand, Canada, USA, and ourselves in the UK to work together on coordinated, coordinated operational and strategic initiatives with the aim of reducing the threat from food crime, supporting industry, and uh, uh, in terms of reducing vulnerability and building capacity. Uh, I met with them this week. Um, sorry, I've met with reps from USA, Canada, Australia and New Zealand this week to discover how we can work together and particularly in light of the, the new threat uh, caused by COVID-19. It's a fantastic opportunity uh, to learn from each other, to share information and intelligence on food crime, but most importantly, to work together on prevention activities. 
Um, and that's it, I suppose, a whistle stop to you. Claire, back to you. Hi. Well, it won't be straight back to me. I've got a couple of questions for you, actually. And, you, and that's really interesting. You just started to talk there about your you're liaising with all these other countries and what they're doing. So, I mean, I want to know a bit more about that because you said you've literally just met with them this week. So what are you doing with these countries? How, what, what kind of clever ways are there for you to, 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 to handle food crime using all that collaboration? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's early days in relation to the, the, the Global Alliance, but it's really an, an important milestone in that whole um, ability to target things collectively. Um, we've seen Operation Opsin, for instance, which is um, a global initiative which is led by Interpol and Europol, which looks to target safe and unfit food. And um, if we go back two years ago, that was probably the first time that the countries worked together on a particular issue. We worked together uh, with another uh, 10 countries uh, in the UK, uh, sorry, in the UK, worked with another 10 countries in Europe, looking specifically at illegally treated tuna. And that in itself, just that collective uh, 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 targeting of resource uh, resulted in, um, well, it resulted in a significant, um, uh, uh, I suppose, outcome of that, you know, you know, coordinated efforts for the first time. Uh, I think there was something like si over 700 samples taken uh, within a week. Um, 50 of those samples, you know, treated, uh, tested illegally or indicated illegal um, uh, treatment. And there was something like 51 tons of tuna seeds. Now that's, excuse the pun, a drop in the ocean in mm. terms of the tuna industry, but that's a 200 million euro fraud every year. And actually, we were able to come up with 15 recommendations that all countries signed up to within Europe. And that's, that's the kind of activity we've got to look at uh, under the global lines as well. So these five countries are new members working collectively on, on similar, similar issues from a food fraud perspective that are affecting us all. That's really exciting, isn't it? Because you just what, the, what you could achieve in just that one collaboration. So that that is really reassuring. <laughs> Bit of reassuring news at the end of your presentation there. Uh, yeah, without doubt, even the whole sharing of um, sharing of information, and intelligence, clear and, and best practice, and potentially getting forewarned of risks that are maybe being experienced in other countries that are shared with us. It gives us that early warning, and we can maybe do stuff to to, to mitigate particularly when you're, when you're talking about importing, importing food products. Okay, thank you so much, Ron. Um, so we'll hear from you again at the, at the end. Um, and now we are going to find out about a technology that can offer a solution to some of the problems that we've been talking about. So Manuel, we're looking to you now to get us all excited about blockchain and supply chains. Okay, very good. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll turn mine off and then I'll pop back on when you're finished. Okay, thank you very much, Claire, and thanks again to all the team and all the audience. I'm very happy to be here with you. So uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Basically, what we are going to uh, look at uh, this morning is, is why uh, supply chains haven't been digitalized uh, until now, if that is such a, a strong uh, recommendation, and, uh, and maybe why is now the moment to do it and how we can do it. So if we move to the next slide, please. So, uh, so the decision of supply chains, of course, there have been many different efforts until today. So uh, uh, the thing is that uh, until today, you have, we have seen uh, integration between some uh, levels of the supply chain. Normally it's uh, big players uh, integrating with uh, their suppliers or their customers. Uh, sometimes even strong players forcing other uh, players to integrate with them, but we are looking at very rigid in integrations. So that means that very uh, high costs, the dedicated efforts, uh, and no flexibility to adapt to different uh, use cases. They were integrations where one to one, and they were not ready to be repeated to many different uh, players. So. Uh, so that's what we have seen today, and what the results of this is that uh, we have small parts of the supply chain that may be integrated, digitalized, so we don't have an end-to-end -end integration. We don't have a real-time or near real-time information of everything that's happening throughout the supply chain. And uh, when digitalized, is is normally imposed by somebody or sponsored by a central uh, player. So other players, they 
either they are forced or uh, they are not especially uh, interested in, in participating because they have to share information for good or, or for bad. And, um, and we are talking about rigid integration. So the focus is on some use cases. So for example, uh, uh, accountancy, production data, uh, delivery data, et cetera. Et cetera. And uh, they are not open to new use cases like uh, sustainability reporting, uh, safety measures and monitoring, uh, innovation, product development, uh, optimized product callbacks, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So how is the current situation forcing us to uh, rethink about how we can digitalize the full supply chain? So nowadays, we are working with uh, a global uh, supply chains, what means, which means that much more complex than they used to be. Uh, we are talking about different legislations throughout the supply chains. So maybe we are com complying with some regulations throughout the, the uh, supply chain, but they are, they are super standards regarding the consumer market, the target markets. Uh, we are seeing uh, even more restricting uh, regulation and uh, requests from the consumer market and the whole supply chain to comply with very high standards. Uh, also, uh, public opinion um, are uh, very uh, becoming stronger and stronger. We are a hyper connected uh, uh, world, and uh, the power of consumers are uh, impacting very seriously our our brands, our capacity to be present in the market, and that uh, means that uh, we we may face very big uh, losses and uh, uh, in terms of uh, sales, in terms of uh, brand capital if we don't manage uh, and prevent issues efficiently. And of course, we have the context of, of the COVID-19 that uh, is, is generating a lot of uh, consciousness about uh, safety, about security, et cetera, et cetera. So the conclusion is that if we really want to be uh, capable of ensuring full safety and also protecting our own business, we have to look at uh, digitalizing the whole supply chain because the whole supply chain is impacting the products we are sending to our end consumers. But uh, it's not uh, it's easier to say than to to do. Uh, we have uh, technical challenges, so uh, we have to integrate diverse systems. Sometimes legacies, sometimes very complex ones, sometimes very uh, simple ones, like somebody uh, managing everything with an Excel or with paper, and others having full ERPs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also the business case, because if we talk about a centralized system where somebody is controlling all the data, so which is the economic uh, incentive for me as a company to participate in a share platform that belongs to a third party. So it's, it's something that we need to work on. And also as well, it's linked to that one is the willingness and the trust to share information. If the, the data is gonna belong to a third party, uh, why are, are we sure we want to share that kind of information? So those are barriers that we need to overcome if we want to fully digitalize supply chains. So if, please, if we can move to the next slide and the next one. Okay, so uh, we, 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 we cut one of the slides uh, in the, regarding the introduction of, of, uh, of the blockchain, so, but I, I need to give you some information before we start. So. Uh, so let's say that uh, uh, blockchain or distributed, distributed ledger technologies is, um, is a system where instead of having a central uh, server, a central player that store all transactional information, that information is shared by the whole uh, system, the whole ecosystem. So all the players, they have a copy of all the transactional data that has been produced throughout the system. And uh, basically the way it works is that uh, all transactions uh, are uh, validated uh, throughout uh, the ecosystem uh, using some consensus uh, protocols that cannot be uh, forged. And uh, then once they are validated, they are grouped into uh, blocks. They are added to the blockchain. That's why it's called uh, blockchain. So what we have in the last block is the shared vision of the uh, truth. So is that the ecosystem says that uh, this is the truth, this, uh, this person has X uh, parts of X elements of one uh, asset, 
and the, the other one has a, a Y uh, elements of that asset. So if you want to be able to transact one asset to another person, then the next time you're gonna do this transaction, the system automatically will validate if those, if you are the owner of that asset and if you have the right to transact it to the other person and if the other person accepted the, the transaction. So it's fully decentralized. So we don't have a, a central player. It's also very secure because the whole information is encrypted. Uh, the data is not immutable, it's, it's, it's now immutable. You cannot modify or forge the way you, you, you want because everybody's sharing the same, the same information. So the data of, of what assets do you have, uh, which capacity do you have to share those uh, assets with another person, to uh, give those assets to another person. And uh, also uh, the trust is, is, is a very important um, concept here because uh, all, uh, all transactions are, are, are validated by consensus. That means that the whole uh, ecosystem is validating that the transaction is correct. No one central player can decide that this is correct and that is not correct. So that generates a lot of trust that allows you to work with completely unknown uh, players because you know that the system is going to treat everybody the same way with the same rules. Also, the last uh, concept that is important to know is, is that the automation, everything happens automatically. You don't need to spend time and money uh, supervising the whole system because everything happens automatically. And also you have some concepts like a smart contracts that allows you to uh, automate a lot of actions. So it's gonna be much faster, much cheaper. So we go back to, uh, to the presentation. Sorry for the very short introduction to blockchain. Don't worry about that. Let's see what we can do with a blockchain. So this is the advantage. So if you can see, you can look at a, a very schematic uh, uh, supply chain. In this case, it's, it's coffee beans and how you produce it up to the time you have uh, coffee and you're on your table. So the idea is that uh, every single step that happens throughout this supply chain is reported back to the blockchain. That means that the whole transaction has been recorded and then you, ha you will have a, uh, the capacity to review it, to audit it, to uh, audit it even physically. So it's a, it's a lot of uh, advantages once you got the whole uh, network uh, um, uh, recorded uh, in real time. So all the, all the information as you see here is, is, is mutable and shared by all participants. You are the owner of the data, so you, you can keep confidential data for yourself. Uh, you have the automated validation. You don't need to, uh, to have uh, uh, supervisory uh, costs for, for the system. You don't have to invest a lot because it's a, a whole system that has been uh, where cost can be easily uh, mutualize among all the different participants. And also you can uh, get into deeper uh, integrations. Uh, like uh, you can start with a very declarative uh, way where you sign the declaration that you do. So everything can be uh, traced back to yourself. But then you can also integrate connected objects like IoT. You can integrate uh, ERPs, production systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, so that's that's what we get. We we used to have an Internet of Information where you have your your protocol HTTP or HTTPS if it's securized, and then you have a, a browser like a Chrome, and then an application like Facebook. So here we have something very similar. You have a distributed ledger technology like a blockchain as a base as a protocol. Then you have Ethereum or any other blockchain. In this case, it's a public one. It could be any, any other blockchain you work with. And then you have a specific application. In this case, for example, it's we trade that uh, this is a system where you can digitalize uh, international trade uh, documentation, especially for, for uh, international uh, trades. So uh, the idea here is the difference is that in the Internet of Information, you could share, for example, a photo thousands of times because you have no, no problem. You can just copy paste it and send it to everybody. In this case, in the internet of value because everybody knows that you are the owner of one asset. So when you declare that you give that asset to another person or that you have moved that asset to another place, then it's registered. You cannot change it back unless that person transfers it back to you. Okay, so uh, we uh, move to the next slide, please. This is just two examples of two platforms that are working, implementing 
uh, blockchain technologies into uh, food traceability. So uh, the top one is is the origin, is a development done uh, between the Bureau of Veritas and, and Worldline. It's a permission blockchain, that means that it's a closed uh, ecosystem that you need to be validated before you start working with them, so as a company. And it's based on, on two uh, um, blockchain uh, technologies, which is multi-chain and Ipelecha fabric. Uh, basically, what you have is a workflow that you can customize and you can implement many different times that can produce any uh, supply chain that you, you, you want in every single uh, action that you apply to, a, um, uh, to an, um, an asset, even uh, within the, uh, the, um, the limits of one organization. So if you move one asset to one uh, storehouse, or if you add it to another lot, et cetera, et cetera. everything that you uh, register, it could be implemented in that uh, uh, workflow. And the very interesting thing is that they include an, an auditor role. So uh, you, you may have a third party, like this HQT, yes, that is gonna be uh, uh, monitoring the activity. And the, the interesting thing is that you will, you will get smarter uh, audits. Like uh, you will get information from the the, uh, the whole supply chain, so that you can identify behaviors that are not uh, useful. So you may you may have like red flags, then you can focus your auditing work on red flags. Like uh, this is there's something strange happening in at one point in one uh, area, so I can send an auditor, physical uh, a person to do a physical audit to get there and to make sure that nothing uh, wrong is happening. Another example, and it's the, the, the final one, is the IBM Food Trust. It's a huge uh, solution implemented in uh, worldwide, developed by IBM. It's based also, again, in permission blockchain. Most of uh, corporate solutions is, are based in permission blockchains. Using IBM blockchain platform, which is a, a private solution based on, on Hyperledger uh, fabric. Uh, they are very solid platform. They have very defined uh, modules that you can uh, subscribe to. And uh, as, as I mentioned, they are they're present worldwide um, and they are one of the pioneers on this, uh, on this area. And uh, with that, I think I conclude, I finish my presentation. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Manuel. That's really fascinating look. And I know it's such a rush, isn't it, to talk about the huge potential of blockchain um, mm -hmm. in, in such a short period of time. And it is a really promising technology. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. But of course, the way that third party quality assurance providers can help is already a proven success story for so many organizations. And our sponsor today, HQTS, is, as I've said, just such a third party quality assurance provider. Um, guys, if you can come back and join me on stage, Dennis and Ron as well, and Manuel, that would be great. So, hi guys, thank you so much. Um, okay. So, Dennis, if we, uh, ensuring safety and integrity of food really needs this sort of strategy, risk assessment, defense plan, all this kind of close monitoring as well. So, surely working with a quality assurance partner, for example, at HQTS, is something that all organizations should really be considering to, help, to, to cope with things like this. Okay, businesses, depending on their size, depending on their reach, will have very, very different strategies. You know, big multinationals like the one that I was involved in have their own internal resources. So, you know, we'll be testing our own products. We'll be auditing our own suppliers with, with, with our own internal teams. And I know that, you know, some of my team are, already, are on today and are part of that whole process. Where you're a, a smaller business or a business that has taken the decision not to have internal resources, then you need to use service providers to continue to manage your supply chain because you know you you could take a risk and use agents uh, buying agents for materials but then you know you you run the risk of not understanding your supply chain not knowing where your materials are coming from and and being reliant upon open markets and that's where ron will tell you you, you represent your greatest risk so working with trusted service providers with whom you can have a relationship and who can operate for you in different parts of the globe is is absolutely a solution it's an absolutely a solution i would recommend uh, uh for your business going forward thank you thank you so 
on the food crime expert, you know, the food crime expert role, what, uh, how do you work with these guys? Do you work with them and, 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 and what does it fit into your processes and the, and the way the police work? Um, well, Claire, I mean, they are, as Dennis said, they're absolutely crucial. Um, I mean, fraud is an issue for every business in every sector. Food's no different. It's got a financial cost. It under, undermines consumer and customer confidence. And in the most serious cases, it can neg negatively impact on consumer health and well-being. We shouldn't forget that. And I think Dennis touched on supply chain. You have to make sure that your supply chain is secure, particularly in these times. And I think that's where you know, your third-party um, companies like HG, HQTS help to provide that, that assurance for you. You have to be able to trust your supply chain. Um, because, you know, uh, business reputations that take years to build, that can be totally destroyed overnight by one issue in relation to, to the integrity of your product. So I couldn't stress enough the need to, to secure that supply chain. Okay, thank you so much. So we're going to move on to the Q&A section now. So there's questions from the audience. But if you'd like to know more about HQTS and their services, please check out their website, hqts.com, or send an email to inquiry at HQS, hqts.com. So let's have a look at the questions now. So, gosh, a few of them coming in and a few we've had from before. So I wanted to say, go to you, Ron, actually. Somebody's question to you was, great to hear about the collaborations through the global supply food chain. And closer to home, though, in the UK, so he's obviously a UK person, the COVID-19 pandemic has seen an exponential increase in unregistered food businesses online. How is the SFCIU, which is the Scottish Food Crime uh, unit and the NFCU combating this and making consumers aware that criminals are exploiting the consumers for cheaper prices. Yeah, well, I was actually trying to answer that clear as we were speaking, but unfortunately, I don't type quickly enough, so I'm glad no, no, that we no, can no, answer it live. <laughs> I'm glad we can answer it live. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with the point. Um, it's an issue that we are seeing in Scotland. Uh, we are seeing that as, a, as an emerging risk. Um, the good thing for us is that um, we did mention our Scottish Food Crime hotline and um, we're getting a lot of information into that 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 telephone number either, either people picking up the phone or by people um, supplying the information on the um, the electronic form you can get on our website we're also getting information from FSA because they're on a similar thing and uh, we get that information within a space of a few hours uh, from uh, uh, the it's run in partnership with Crime Stoppers um, and we pass that information on to our, our local uh, our local authorities who enforce uh, food law within Scotland. That works really well because we've got a good partnership with the local authorities. And um, so um, we are making sure that the information that's coming in about unregistered businesses is passed on as quickly as possible. Uh, we also ran a campaign um, oh, probably about two or three weeks ago now, basically on uh, the telltale signs of food crime. Uh, because we were, um, you know, it, it was quite clear that because of these things, because of um, people now uh, changing their buying habits, you know, lots of home deliveries, lots of businesses um, um, cropping up. We thought it was really important to, um, to highlight that. So we ran a campaign uh, highlighting the telltale signs of food crime uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I would imagine we will run that again um, uh, regularly as, 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 as you work through COVID-19 until we're out the other side of it. Thank you. We just had a question, um, which is not one you guys can answer, but maybe may of concern to people. Is there a way to access today's webinar again? Um, because people have loved what you're saying and not been able to take note of all of it. I do believe that HQTS is recording it and they will be able to send it to you if you're registered to attend today's webinar, which obviously you are because you're online. So hopefully that copy will be something that you can access. But um, yeah, again, I will get them to confirm that. Hopefully somebody can answer that for me now and then, and then we can know. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So um, I had another question actually for, for you, Manuel. Obviously this is really broad, but um, apart from blockchain, what other IT development systems could people use to improve food safety and modernize supply chains? I guess this is going to be a list of things you haven't got time to go into all the fabulous IT that's out there and technology. Oh, you're on mute. 
sentence of the deck sentence of the year Sorry. <laughs> yeah you could completely right um okay so it's it's actually a very good question because you don't use blockchain by on, on its own it doesn't make that much sense you have to combine it with a lot of uh, uh, different uh, technologies which are most of them are very material by, by by now so in blockchain what you you use it basically to keep uh, referential data that everybody can use so everybody has access to the same data and nobody can manipulate them, the shared data. But the real information is, is shared in, in traditional places, like uh, it could be hosted in, in a company, it could be cloud, uh, it could be many different places. There are shared uh, services that you will have in the cloud, you will have APIs, you can, uh, services that allow you to to uh, uh, generate third party uh, or front end uh, solutions for everybody to participate in the system, like a website or a uh, mobile app uh, for, for, or a tablet one or whichever any front, of, uh, front end uh, software that you will need adapted to your requirements. Maybe you need people to use smartwatch or maybe you need to use uh, any other front-end solution. So with these APIs, you can, you can use it. We may also mention that um, we, we can have a very simplistic uh, share platform where you just declare things and you sign so that everything that you say, it could be traced back to you so that you are not uh, uh, motivated to lie in your, in your uh, declarations, but also you can use uh, connected data like IoT, Internet of Things. So, they are the connected uh, objects are declaring or reporting back to the share uh, platform uh, data constantly. You can integrate existing production systems, ERPs, CRMs, whichever you want. And the, the interesting thing is that it's not only that you are integrating into the system, that is you're also bringing information back to your systems. You are making your systems much more intelligent thanks to that. And also another uh, level, which is very interesting, is that you're gonna have information throughout the whole system. So you will know in real time or near real time what's happening in the system. So if you have, if you see that something is getting blocked at the uh, at the uh, um, uh, at the beginning of the supply chain, you may have that information today instead of learning it uh, two months later. Or if you have, or you see that there are some issues, repeating issues in one place, maybe you want to decide to change that supplier because it's not a good player, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot of things that uh, once you start with very simple things, once you start accumulating data, then for example, you can apply big data, uh, machine learning, uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, things that are gonna make your decision much more smarter than today, just because you will have much more data. So it's going to require a lot of sophistication and, and digitization for, for people to to be really cracking this, isn't it? So obviously yeah. it's a it's not for everybody at this point, but it's going to become more widespread. Well, okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's important to, to 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 know that uh, you can start in a very simple way. Okay. And then and, and then get comp and get much more complex. But not everybody needs to get complex. You may you may have somebody with a small track moving things around and they just want a web page where they declare some stuff, they sign with the private key and that's all. And they don't need anything else. And then you have another company that have production systems that want to get integrated. They want sensors to keep the, the cold chain, for example, data constantly reporting to, and that's, that's fine. They will get that integration, but you will have both players integrated into the, the share platform, the end to end supply chain. And what you mentioned about third parties also is very important. The, the fact that you digitalize the supply chain doesn't mean that people are not important. F very far from that. You will still will need audit auditors probably just to check to validate some elements without the supply chain. The thing is that you will have smarter interventions. You will see where you can focus and then you will kick out players that are not uh, good players out of the system. So, uh, but you still, you will need the participation of people, the, uh, the understanding, the learning, the uh, adaptation of different peoples to work into this fully integrated uh, shared system. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. So yeah, it's, 
it's there's an entry level point which is good yeah. to know and also it's just playing with what you've you know it's using these amazing things to to make your systems as, as effective as possible okay we've got another question here from Iiza in singapore i think this is um Dennis, probably this is for you, but probably for anybody. But what is the top priority in ensuring food safety for post-pandemic food businesses? Okay, so I, if I just, if I may, just add a little bit onto the last question. What yeah, I would say it. to everybody is, you know, if you can't, you know, stretch to blockchain because blockchain is is a new is a new concept and it's a new developing uh, opportunity. I would say. You know, have a basic integrated quality management system. And you can, those things you can get off the shelf, those uh, can be hosted or you can buy them yourselves. I've even had factories that have developed those with a simple Excel spreadsheet. But as I, uh, but I, I absolutely support Manuel's view that, you know, you need to take your paperwork and turn it digital. You know, get your information onto a digital platform and then you can scale that up as you see fit. You know, even if you're a small business, just record things digitally. Back to this question, and I think, you know, my view of this pandemic is that it is another incident in the world. And it's, a, you know, it's a tragic incident for all those people that have been affected and our hearts go out to everybody across the world who has been affected by it, the many, many millions of people and their families. Uh, I also remember, I'm old enough to remember the millennium bug where you know, planes were going to fall out of the sky on uh, on New Year's Day. Uh, guess what? They didn't. So from my point of view, whatever you already do for food safety, you still need to do. Uh, and you still need to continue to do that. What I would suggest is that, you know, as as we evolve and we understand more about our risks, if you have found yourself falling short during this pandemic because you've you know you've got people working from home that would normally be in and around your factories or your manufacturing supply chains or you haven't been able to audit your suppliers or you haven't been able to do the checks and balances because you can't get access to things because you can't travel uh, you can't do the tests because you can't get access to your service providers you know think about all of those things that have happened make sure that they are that when you review and renew your HACCP plans, your TASAP plans, your VASAP plans, those things that present a risk uh, or a threat to you uh, internally or externally, then just make sure that you incorporate all the things that you've learnt from this process. And there's so much information available out there. I'll go back to the IFST, Institute of Food Science and Technology, uh, uh, COVID-19 Information Hub. There's a huge amount of work. We've been putting information on there week by week by week for, for months and months and months now. So use all of that information to reassess your, your supply chain risk and then represent yourselves uh, in the new world. Um, uh, and that's my advice. But also, as I said, you know, get help from external service providers where you need it. There are lots of people out there with decades of experience that, that, that can help you to, uh, to manage that going forward, Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I was actually going to ask all of you as well for your kind of the key thing you wanted people to to take away from this. What do you think that that uh, that is? And I think, Dennis, you summed that up really well. It is that it is that basic. Well, not the ba it's, it's almost like basic hygiene, isn't it? You've got to get that process really, really clear and digitized as much as you possibly can. Um, I'm, I might come to you guys and the rest of you for that. Um, so Ron, what would be the key thing you would want people to do in the food industry after listening to this webinar? What do you think that main takeaway should be? Um, you need to protect your supply chain. Um, in terms of food fraud, you know, businesses need to treat food fraud as any other business risk and give it as, 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 as much importance. And I think Dennis is right, you know, this is another incident, it's an unfortunate incident, but, you know, it's it creates vulnerability. It creates vulnerability amongst businesses. But I think if you've got a, an effective strategy in place already to deal with it and you can adapt it to this, then that's what you need to be prepared for. You know, it's, it's something that we need to, to focus on um, yeah, it will eventually, hopefully, uh, go away and we'll all go back to normal. But at the moment, um, uh, it isn't. And you need to make sure that your strategy is effective, that your supply chain is secure. 
uh, mm. so that you aren't the victim. Brilliant, thank you. The so, victim. <laughs> we're running out of time. Manuel, can you tell me in 20 seconds? <laughs> 20 seconds. I, I think you have, as Dennis said, you have to digitalize your uh, systems, but also you have to extend that digitization towards your supply chain. Otherwise, you are depending on something which is a black box. So you yeah. may suffer out of that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So thank you so much to everybody for, for taking part today. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, and I think you know, everybody who's, who's on it has learned something um, and taken away some new information. Um, thank you so much to HQTS for making this conversation happen. They are hopefully going to send everything out to you, a recording out to everybody who's registered. But, but if you would just in case, um, make sure that you want to get a recording. If you want to get a recording, just either quickly put your details in the chat now or send um, a message to inquiry at hqts.com to make sure you get hold of the copy. Um, thank you so much, Dennis Tracy, Ron McNaughton, Manuel Mercado for the great experiences and um, all the insights that you brought. Thank you so much, everybody, for being a part of it. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Have you. a nice bye. day. Bye Thank bye. You,